Hello, I'm Sandra Rappaport. This is the first of a two-part mini-series on the Book of Ruth entitled Ruth, Two Love Stories. Each lecture will last about 30 minutes. I hope these lectures enhance your Shavuot holiday. Jews the world over will soon be reading Megillah Ruth, the Book of Ruth, to help celebrate the festival of Shavuot. Megillat Ruth, one of the five Megillot comprising the sacred writings or Kituvim section of the Hebrew Bible, is a favorite of mine. In my book, Biblical Seductions, I discuss at length why the love story between Ruth and Boaz endures and fascinates. For this holiday, we will examine the Megillah text in two lecture segments of about 30 minutes each, follow the thrilling action of the characters, and discuss the essential messages of Ruth's story. With its themes of love of the stranger, immigration, displacement, poverty, loyalty, caring for an elderly relative, and endurance, we will need to remind ourselves that this beautifully crafted story is over 3,000 years old. Our goal is to appreciate why this biblical story resonates not only particularly on Shavuot, but also year round. Really, the story of Megillat Ruth, the Book of Ruth, is a biblical love story twice over. First, it tells the story of a loyal and loving relationship between two unlikely women who are ostensible opposites. One is young, the other is old. One is a Moabite, daughter of idolaters, the other is a God-fearing Israelite. You would think they have nothing in common to bind them, and at first, they do not. The second unlikely love story that unfolds in Megillat Ruth is between the same young woman and a much older man. She is a destitute Moabite widow, and he is a prince and judge in Judah. We would be correct to ask, what unites these characters? What is the Torah's message in Megillat Ruth? Let me give you a little overview of some of the themes in the Book of Ruth. One essential message of the Book of Ruth is that this story demonstrates the extraordinary power of love. Not the Valentine's Day hallmark holiday love of the secular every day, although that is certainly worthwhile, but love channeled as chesed, a Hebrew term that is translated as extraordinary, surprising kindness or generosity that goes beyond expected obligation. For example, in Megillat Ruth, we see the embodiment of what it means to love the stranger, the ger in Hebrew. We see the familiar story of Naomi taking the stranger Ruth under her wing, of Naomi taking Ruth with her as she leaves Moab and returns to Judah. We then see them both walking together through the gates of Beit Lechem. Ruth is the stranger among the Judahites. But Megillat Ruth also tells the story of Naomi, the Judahite who emigrated years before from Judah to Moab. So Naomi is also a stranger in this Megillah, a stranger among the Moabites, and Ruth cares for her mother-in-law when Naomi is widowed in that strange and hostile land. So we see that both women are strangers in their turn in the story that turns on loving the stranger. Both these acts of loving the stranger are difficult, anti-cultural, and surprising behaviors, not only because the two countries, Moab and Judah, are historical enemies, but also because the two women have much cause to resent, suspect, and dislike one another. Which brings us to another important reason we read this Megillah. The story of Megillah Ruth repairs ruptures in the foundational biblical history as told in the book of Genesis. How so? Ruth is a daughter of Moab, and we should ask, who is Moab? Ah, in the marvelous tapestry that is the Torah, we are able to trace Moab's roots to his birth about three centuries earlier. Moab is the son born from the incestuous coupling 
between Lot, Abraham's nephew, and Lot's elder daughter when she thought, the Torah tells us in Genesis chapter 19, that her whole world had been destroyed in the fires of Sodom and Amorah, and that she, her sister, and their aged father were the sole survivors of the Holocaust that incinerated her world. The son, born to Lot's elder daughter, was named Moav, or in Hebrew, Me'av, meaning from father. And thus, the nation of Moab grew to become Isra the Israelites' next door neighbor and forbidden idol worship, idol worshiping enemy. So Ruth's integration into the family of Boaz at the very end of this Megillah repairs the biblical breach between Abraham and Lot. Another wrong righted here is Lot's daughter's incestuous seduction of her father in that mountain cave. That tainted sexual act meets its antithesis here in Ruth's, a Moabite woman's reserved and responsible, and as it turns out, chaste, seduction of Boaz, a son of Judah, at midnight on the threshing floor in chapter 3 of this Megillah. There is yet a third instance of Ruth repairing a foundational family rupture from early in the Bible. Our story of productive collaboration between the women, Ruth and Naomi, also repairs the story of the social and sexual competition between two earlier biblical women, Rachel and Leah, two sisters and rival wives of the patriarch Jacob. And finally, this story of a strong unto death bond between Naomi, an elderly Israelite, and Ruth, a younger foreign woman, mirrors, echoes, and corrects the destructive animosity between Sarah and Hagar in the book of Genesis. In the earlier story, the elderly Israelite insider, Sarah, wife of Abraham, caused her husband to expel Hagar, her young Egyptian handmaid and Abraham's concubine. Incidentally, in both stories of Hagar and Ruth, the foreign younger woman is described repeatedly in the Bible as a handmaid, or shifcha in Hebrew. But what a difference between Hagar, the handmaid, and Ruth in our story. Here in Megillat Ruth, we see an evolution of understanding and a resolution of these earlier family conflicts through acceptance and true affection. This tiny book effects quite a reversal of some of the foundational stories in the book of Genesis. So, Megillat Root is a love story. It is a story that repairs family ruptures. And importantly, it is also a story of redemption and transformation. From stranger or handmaid and outsider to welcome beloved insider and em malchut, Hebrew for the mother of a royal dynasty. Let us spend a little time understanding the bond and eventually the growing love between Naomi and Ruth. This is essential if we are to understand and explain the Megillah's other love story between Ruth and Boaz, because to give you a heads up about the second drama in this Megillah, it is not Ruth's idea to go down to the threshing floor in chapter three and to sleep at Boaz's feet. It is Naomi's idea. Ask yourselves, how could Ruth, the Moabite woman who has spent the past three months shedding her Moabite persona to become a true woman of Israel? How could Ruth now act in the manner of a common harlot? And the answer is she could not and would not, but for her trust in and love for Naomi. It is Naomi who suggests that Ruth act like a Moabite woman, brazen and seductive, Ruth has all this time been behaving like an Israelite, caring for her old and widowed mother-in-law and modestly gleaning at the edges of a rich man's fields to feed both Naomi and herself. These are Israelite values, unique in the ancient Near East. How can Ruth turn her back on those teachings and now revert to being a Moabite? What's more, how can she behave in this sexually audacious way and still be, in effect, canonized 
as Em Malchut, the mother of future Israelite royalty. To answer these questions, we must, we must dissect the relationship between the two childless widows, one young, one old, one Moabite, one Israelite, who on the surface of things would appear to have nothing at all in common. We want to understand what happens to change their hearts and minds. It would be correct to point out that the backdrop of the story of Ruth is the barley harvest. And it is also correct that originally the festival of Shavuot was an agricultural event, the bringing of Bikurim, the first fruits of the harvest. All this is true. But let us look beyond this meaningful agricultural and seasonal commonality, because if the barley harvest were all that bound the story of Ruth to the festival of Shavuot, there would have been no need for four full chapters of fascinating and suspenseful personal drama in the Megillah. The book of Ruth is highly unusual among the canonized books of the Torah. The Hebrew Bible is overwhelmingly narrative. In contrast of the 85 verses of Megillat Ruth, more than half of them are dialogue. Megillat Ruth is, on the one hand, a book that hinges on Israelite law, halacha in Hebrew, and it even makes new law. Yet on the other hand, it is a book that tells a compelling human story through its unusual use of dialogue. Its characters are forever speaking to one another. Jewish people are instructed several times a day in our prayers and blessings to remember that you were strangers in the land of Egypt. Remembering the fact that God took us out of a land that enslaved the stranger and gave us laws and land within which to construct a just society is, the core pre is a core precept of the Jewish people. The festival of Shavuot, whose very name means weeks, occurs exactly seven weeks from the moment of our exodus from Egypt, the land where our ancestors remained strangers for 400 years. God redeemed this nation of strangers, brought us to the revelation at Mount Sinai, and thus elevated and sanctified 600,000 strangers and gave us laws to live by. So we can and should identify with and show empathy for the stranger or outsider. It is no coincidence then that Ruth, the heroine of our story, is herself first a stranger, second, a widow, and third, impoverished. She is thrice over at the lowest rung of ancient Near East society. And because she is also childless, Ruth collides with at least two of ancient Israelite society's strange yet essential laws. The first is the law that allows the poor to glean behind the harvesters keeping fallen sheaves of grain for themselves, known in Hebrew collectively as the law of Leket, Shechacha, and Pe'ah. And the second is the law that expects a childless widow to wed her deceased husband's brother in order to produce an heir and, produce, and preserve the deceased's name and inheritance. This is known as the Leveret Law. In Hebrew, Yibum. How Ruth and Naomi react to one another. How the Judahite society of Beit Lechem reacts to the stranger Ruth and to the returning widow Naomi. How Ruth reacts to Naomi's outrageous seduction suggestion. And how Boaz reacts to his kinswoman Naomi and to the stranger Ruth. All these are tests of the Israelite people's ability to live the precepts they learned firsthand in Egypt. Ruth's story is therefore a morality tale for us, dramatically showing us how we must behave and how we must apply God's law in the trenches. It is one thing to recite in the abstract that we must love a stranger. It is quite another thing to love a stranger who is a member of the reviled and detested Moabites. 
When we read Megillat Rut out loud in synagogue on Shavuot, we confront our characters with all their ambivalences and doubts, their prejudices, their faiths, and their heroism. The text and the Midrash, the legend literature of the Bible, love these biblical characters. Let us see how they behave and understand why we read Ruth. Let us begin at the beginning. Megillat Ruth is an exquisitely structured tiny book with life and death and life and love dramas packed into every one of its four chapters. Once you begin reading it, you truly cannot put it down. Questions clamor to be answered. Why do Naomi and her family travel to Moab in the first place? Why is Naomi now determined to return to Judah? What does Naomi really want? Does she desire a Moabite companion? Or does she wish to be rid of the girl? How do the Israelites react to Naomi's return with Ruth in tow? How do the two destitute women subsist? How does Ruth meet Boaz, a judge and tribal chief? And how and why does she come to sleep at his feet on the night of the harvest festival? Why does she seek a redeemer? And who will assume this role? And perhaps most important of all, we seek to answer the question, why would a Moabite woman's act of sexual audacity, remember that in chapter three, she will visit Boaz at night on the threshing floor, merit her being the ancestor of King David, and ultimately, some say, the Messiah? The answer must lie in Ruth's journey from Moab to Judah, more than a journey of topographical miles. In reality, a more arduous journey of the spirit, of one woman's struggle against prejudice, a journey from idolatry into righteousness. It is a difficult trek, so to understand it, let us try to experience Ruth's journey along with her. The book of Ruth takes place, we are told, when the judges judged. In the period of time, between Joshua's death and the anointing of Saul as the first king of Israel, when there was as yet no single nationally recognized leader exerting control over the people of Israel. In fact, at that time, Israel was more a tribal confederacy than a nation as we know it. It was a time of widespread corruption and judicial chaos, during which the Bible repeatedly tells us, each man did what was right in his eyes. Not only was it a time of fraud and irresponsibility, but early on, the story adds desperation and hunger into the mix, telling us there was a famine in the land. Despite the famine, the Megillah tells us about only one man who leaves Judah for greener pastures. The man's name is Elimelech, and from the meaning of his name, translated from Hebrew as kingship is mine, we have an early hint that another important subtext of the book of Ruth is kingship. In verse three of the first chapter, Elimelech is referred to as husband of Naomi. The prefix husband of is an unusual prefix when referring to a male biblical character, and it tips us off that in this story, the man's wife is of important merit on her own. We will see that although her husband will disappear from the narrative, Naomi will slip into his role of head of family and will initiate and plot much of the dramatic action. Megillat Root becomes a woman's story with women in decisive roles, speaking important and morally urgent speeches and taking urgent risks to save themselves and to sustain their nearly extinct family lines. Chapter one tells us that Elimelech is an Israelite nobleman, an Ephratite, according to the text, an important landed lord from Bethlehem, a man of vast wealth whose fields and enterprises sustain a great portion of the people of Bethlehem. Note that the word Ephratite describing Elimelech also reminds us of Ephrat, which was the place to which the matriarch Rachel had been headed when she died on the road, giving birth to Benjamin, her second son. 
So the word Ephratite, describing Elimelech, conjures up for the biblical reader women's existential trouble, danger, and death, a motif that is certainly present in Migilat Ruth, the Book of Ruth. Back to Elimelech. According to the Babylonian Talmud, um, Bava Batra 91a, he is one of the four sons of Nachshon, the prince of the tribe of Judah who was a trusted aide to Moses. Do you remember Nachshon? It was Nachshon who, during the exodus from Egypt, Egypt, waded up to his neck into the roiling waters of the Red Sea in full view of the entire company of terrified Israelites. Nachshon had unwavering faith that God would perform, perform a miracle, allowing Israelites to escape Pharaoh's pursuing chariots. And perhaps in response to Nachshon's steadfast heroism, it was when the sea waters reached the level of his nostrils that God caused the Red Sea to split, allowing the Israelites to cross on a strip of dry land. This man, Nachshon, was Elimelech's father, an honored and beloved true hero in Israel. Well, given Elimelech's impeccable provenance, it is a shock to read that in response to the famine in the land of Judah, Elimelech decamps with his family and travels across the Jordan River and east of the Dead Sea to relocate in the fields of Moab, Israel's enemy. On a practical level, it was the custom in times of trouble for the local Lord to take a leadership role, opening his storehouses or fields and sharing his bounty with the townspeople who worked for him throughout the year. This was expected of Elimelech, a tribal leader. The locals depended on his assistance to see them through times of famine and drought. And the Midrash, the Bible's legend literature, tells us that Elimelech's wealth would have sufficed to sustain all of Beit Lechem for a period of 10 years. Yet, Elimelech had no intention of opening his storehouses to share his wealth. When the drought hit, he packed up his family, took a vast portion of his fortune with him, and left his brothers in Beit Lechem alone and terrified. Isn't it ironic that Elimelech is fleeing a famine in Beit Lechem, the place whose name means house of bread? Life was comfortable in Moab. The famine had not spread across the river from Judah. The weeks turned into years and Elimelech and his family settled in Moab permanently. We are told that it is this change of intention from temporary sojourner to permanent resident in the land of the enemy that was his undoing in God's eyes. Elimelech's wife is Naomi, and his two sons, Machlon and Chilion, marry Moabite women, one named Orpah and the other named Ruth. The Talmud in Sota and Sanhedrin teaches us that both Ruth and Orpah are royal princesses, either the daughters or granddaughters of Eglon, the Moabite king. We also learn that the son's marriages to these two Moabite women were barren. The fortunes of the family of Elimelech dwindle away in Moab. Elimelech dies and 10 years later, both his adult sons fall ill and die as well. We are struck at Naomi's turn of fortune. A family unit that had once been dominated by males is now entirely made up of females. The elderly, the elderly Naomi and her two Moabite daughters-in-law. <clears throat> Naomi, still God-fearing despite her exile and widowhood, sees the deaths of her husband and sons, the loss of her fortune, and the barrenness of their Moabite, Moabite wives for what they are. She understands that her family has been singled out for divine punishment. We ask, why did God punish the family of Elimelech? Elimelech's fatal sin, we learn, was a failure of chesed, a repudiation of duty and connection to and responsibility for his countrymen, those in need during the great drought. This beautifully constructed Megillah opens with Elimelech's sin, his self 
exile in Moab, his integration into Moabite society, his unexpected death, and ten years later, after following in their father's uncaring footsteps, the untimely deaths of his two sons. Literarily and morally, then, we appreciate that for Naomi to make her way back to Judea, spiritually as well as physically, we will expect that she will have to suffer and endure the backwash of her Israelite family's punishment and shame, and also engage personally in an act that is suffused with chesed and unexpected goodness in order to right the cosmic balance. In order to make up for Elimelech's sin of abandonment of responsibility. Let us see how she does this. Following Naomi's personal calamity, the text makes clear that she is a woman left behind. She is alone, a widow, and now childless as well as penniless. She has neither sustenance nor physical protection. She is at the very bottom of ancient Near East society's societal totem pole. It is fair to assume that Naomi was also in a state of sadness and depression. Later on in our story, she will tell the curious Israelites not to call her by her name Naomi, which means pleasantness in Hebrew, but to call her Mara, meaning bitterness. In Moab, Naomi, an expatriate Israelite and an aged childless widow, lacks the familial or societal safety valve, the net that she would have had back home in Beit Lechem of Judah. Ironically, because of her husband's stinginess and kingly pretensions, she is now worse off than she would have been had she remained in drought-stricken Judah years ago. At least in Judah, she would have suffered through the famine with her family around her, sharing her wealth and resources and fate with her countrymen. But alone in Moab, without kith, kin, or coin, it would seem that Naomi's fate is sealed. We're told that Naomi hears that the famine in Judah has lifted, and she resolves to return to her homeland. She does not want to die in Moab. So Naomi leaves Moab, and her two daughters-in-law accompany her on the road. It is a 75-kilometer journey from Moab to Beit Lechem, and on foot, it should take about two weeks of steady walking. Because the women left in haste, they have no stores of food or water and are forced to live off the land, drinking from streams and eating whatever fruit they can forage. The desert sun is unrelenting and the rock-strewn path makes it slow going. Their clothing hampers their every step as it was made for housework and short trips and not for arduous foot travel. Their flimsy sandals quickly give way, and the Midrash tells us they were reduced to walking barefoot. As the three women walk through the Moabite wilderness, they care for each other, helping one another as they stumble and grow thirsty and weary. If they were wary co-travelers when the journey began, the rigors of the trip bring them to a better understanding of one another, as unprotected women trying their best to subsist. This difficult migration from one homeland to another pushes them into a physical dependency on one another. As they walk, Naomi talks to Orpah and Ruth about her homeland of Beit Lechem of Judah, of her youth, of her God, and of Israelite laws relating to daily life. In a marvelous interpretation, the Midrash infers Naomi's monologue from the word vatelachna in verse 7, meaning they walked or they went, which has the same Hebrew root word as halacha, meaning both law and going. The Midrash says they walked, and as Naomi talked, Ruth and Orpah listened and learned, and all the time the Moabite women were being introduced to the laws of Naomi's Israelite religion. When they arrive at the border between Moab and Judah, the time has come for Naomi to send her daughters-in-law back and to venture into Judah alone. Naomi never forgets 
that neither of the two girls has been granted a child that would link them to her and to the line of Elimelech. They really have no reason to, rem to remain with her. They were young and beautiful, and the Midrash tells us that their lives stretched before them like an unfurled ribbon. In cruel contrast, Naomi had lived her life, buried her husband and sons, and forfeited her future. She was heading home to die. So, at the end of the Moabite road, Naomi turns to Orpah and Ruth and says, Lechna, Shovna, go, please return, each of you, to the house of your mother. As I touched on earlier, despite her best intentions, Naomi is bitter. She looks at the young Moabite women, and despite these past weeks of companionship, she still sees the instruments of her son's sinfulness. We can appreciate that on some level, Naomi wants to be rid of her two Moabite daughters-in-law. In fact, they pose a hindrance to her if she wishes to live out her life in Judah among Israelites who view Moab as the enemy and her husband's migration there years earlier as a betrayal. Naomi wishes them gone. So Naomi tries three times to convince Ruth and Orpah to return to their mother's house and not to accompany her to Judah. Three times she employs the word shovna, meaning please return. The Midrash tells us that this is the number of times a prospective convert must be turned away when he or she expresses a desire to become a member of the Jewish faith. If the intended convert persists, even after the third rebuff, she must be accepted as sincere. We will see that this will come to pass with one of Naomi's daughters-in-law. For the first time at the border to Judah, Naomi calls Ruth and Orpah Benotai, my daughters, three times in these verses. Instead of the previous Kaloteha, or less personal word meaning daughters-in-law. The circumstances of their difficult journey and their sincere intention to return with Naomi to Judah have brought the three women closer. Naomi's hostility is fading, and we infer that she feels a growing compassion for her daughters-in-law. So Naomi warns her daughters that they face enormous obstacles if they accompany her into Judah. They have essentially three strikes against them already. Not only will an Israelite man be leery of marrying a Moabite woman, but the two are also penniless, childless widows. We know from the text that Orpah accedes to Naomi's argument and turns back to return to her homeland. The Midrash actually condemns Orpah for giving in so readily. We won't explore Orpah's return journey here. Naomi is left on the road on the way back to Judah, stuck with her other daughter-in-law, Ruth. I say stuck because that is the actual language of the text. In chapter 1, verse 14, we read, Verut davka ba, and Ruth clung to her. The Hebrew word for glue is devek from the very same root. The meaning is clear. Ruth stuck with Naomi, or conversely, Naomi was stuck with Ruth, her Moabite daughter-in-law. A marvelous double meaning, signaling Naomi's ambivalent emotions. Ruth's sister Orpah is returning home, but Ruth is clinging to Naomi. Ruth is plighting her troth to this older woman who has tried her best to discourage her from accompanying her into Judah. But as we will see, Ruth is complex. She, like all of us, has multiple needs. She is in need of a mother, of a comrade, of a link to her dead husband, of a family, and of a future. This older woman who has nothing material to offer and is bent on returning to a land she had forsaken is Ruth's only emotional lifeline. So she reaches for it. This mother-in-law and daughter-in-law exhibit an unselfish recognition and devotion to one another. Naomi 
begs Ruth to return to Moab, though she knows she would do better on a trip, an arduous foot journey with a companion. Let me read you Ruth's unforgettable response from chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. And Ruth replied, Entreat me not to leave you, to turn back and not to follow you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. This and more may the Lord do to me, if anything but death separates me from you. Wow. These verses give us the chills. They are certainly the most renowned words in the book of Ruth, arguably in the entire Hebrew Bible. Ruth's words bind her to Naomi as securely as if she is swearing an oath. In fact, Ruth's words are so compelling that we will see them appear twice more later on in the Tanakh to demonstrate solemn and credible promises of fidelity and allegiance between biblical kings. Let me show you one example. As pointed out by the late Bible scholar Tikva Freimer Kensky, in the book of Kings at 1 Kings chapter 22, more than a century into the future, King Jehoshaphat of Judah, joining Israel's king in a war against the enemy king of Aram, solemnly promises, listen to it, I will do what you do. My troops will be your troops. My horses shall be your horses. We recognize the phrases, the phrasing, the cadence and intent of those words, don't we? Ruth, a destitute, destitute Moabite widow, spoke those words from her heart at the crossroads of Moab and Judah. We see now that Ruth was speaking in the language of kings. Envision Ruth, her tears drying on her cheeks, speaking earnestly to Naomi, standing at the sun-baked, rocky border. Ruth has one chance to make her words count, or she will be sent back to Moab, to an empty existence that has ceased to have any meaning for her. She is pleading for her very life. Naomi must believe her. She must be moved to actually adopt Ruth as her daughter. It is important for us to appreciate what Ruth has just done. Here are the words of Bible scholar and author Phyllis Tribble. Quote, for a young and beautiful woman to turn away from the familiar and adopt the uncertain and the dangerous future, to tie herself not to a man or a husband or a clan, but to another woman, is quite simply a radical act. It is without precedent in the Bible. Ruth has committed herself utterly to an old Israelite woman who is not her blood kin. The Bible has never before recorded such an act. A young woman has committed herself to the life of an old woman rather than to the search for a husband. One female has chosen another female in a world where life depends upon men." Close quote. Ruth's statement of commitment is a complete literary surprise. It speaks of Ruth's hopelessness and resignation. As a barren widow of an exiled Israelite, she realistically forsakes any prospect of a husband in Moab, and she has been warned that no Israelite will wish to marry her in Judah. Yet still, she clings to Naomi. She has nothing and hopes for nothing. Yet Ruth's moral sense and her love for the older woman edge out her despair. She will cleave to her Israelite mother-in-law, accompany her back into Judah, and trust herself to Naomi's God. With everything else stripped away, we see that Ruth's love is the moving force here. That is the end of the first lecture in our two-part mini-series on the Book of Ruth. Please tune in for part two on this website in about half an hour.